Hey, how you doing? This is RJ. So today, I'm going to talk about why there is such a thing as objectively bad art. Why you have these quote-unquote progressive people, and they produce objectively bad art. And in the second half of this video, I'm going to talk a little bit about what you might qualify as a Chad hero. So I'm going to break this down into sections because I've done a number of videos about objectively bad art. I'm going to go over the arguments that I present in those videos, but only very briefly. I'm also going to link all those videos in the description, so if you want the expanded take on those, you can go and watch those directly. And before I begin, I'll have to define my terms. What is art in order for me to declare there's such a thing as bad art? And what is the art that I'm usually dealing with, which is the story? And, as usual, I'm going to go with the old definition. The definition that's been around, at the very least, in Western civilization for 2,400 years. I would say it goes back an easy 3,000 years in Western civilization. But my point being is that, first of all, this is defined that way and has been defined that way for so long because it is actually a reflection of reality. And secondly, you're not going to change 3,000 years of history or 2,400 years of history just because you have a blip of quote-unquote progressivism for the last 50 years. And I'm going to use those definitions according to Aristotle. Why? Because Aristotle also gave us the first glimpse in Western civilization of what logic actually is. So his definitions are very reasonable and logical. And to put that in another way, since reason and logic are based upon reality, so too are these definitions based upon reality. So a story, like most pieces of art, is a reflection of reality. And both the medievals and the ancients understood that, yes, we as human beings find a representation of reality pleasurable. Why? Well, one of the main reasons is because we are imitative learners. Especially when we're kids, we're imitative learners. And a story, like a lot of pieces of art, is teaching you something new. And it is hearkening back to that childlike wonder kind of exploration that you did in order to learn things when you were a little kid. So we find reflections of reality to be pleasurable. And really, this is what any art is. The definition of art is the ability for someone to take an idea from their mind and bring it into external reality. And the better the artist they are, A, the easier they're able to take that idea and put it into external reality, and B, the more the artist understands the limitations of external reality in order to bring that idea into existence. Now, this works in several different ways, but let's look at a base way of looking at art for a second. If you look at something like an architect or a shipbuilder, in this old definition, yes, they are artists. And what they do is they take their idea, which is an idea of a building or a ship, and of course they take this idea by looking at reality around them, by looking at mathematics, by looking at angles, by looking at natural structures and saying, I'm going to build something like a natural structure, but with all these bits of reality put together in a unique way. And so what they do is they take their idea and they put it down on a piece of paper, which is a blueprint. And that blueprint is known as a symbol or a sign. It's a sign of the thing that they're going to take into reality. And when they start to build the building or build the ship, if it actually stands up as a building and does what it's supposed to do, if it actually floats as a boat and does what it's actually supposed to do, then yes, that's a good piece of art. Why? Because it is reflecting the reality both of what was in their mind and the reality that allows it to exist in external matter. Because if it couldn't exist in external matter, if their idea was so fanciful that it wasn't going to exist, when they tried to build the building, it would simply fall down. But if we look at something that we typically think of as art, if we look at a painting, if we look at a comic book, if we look at a movie, if we look at a television show, these are pieces of art. But they're substantially different in a very unique way from something like a building or a ship. Why? Because you have that artist. They have an idea in their mind. And typically they put it down on a piece of paper or something of the like. And that is their symbol or sign of this piece of art. But they don't carry on and bring that into external existence beyond the point of putting it down on a piece of paper. Now you might say that something like a television show or a movie or a play does actually bring it into external reality, but really that's just another kind of symbol. Certainly a more detailed kind of symbol, but a symbol nonetheless. 
But what the artist is really doing when they put down on a piece of paper their story or their poem or anything that you consider a piece of art is that they're relying even more heavily upon the rules of reality in some sense than even the architect or the shipbuilder is. Why? Because you, as the audience, is the one who brings that thing to life. You bring it to life within your own mind, and you bring it to life within your own mind through the medium of reality. That is to say, you have an author. They understand the reality that exists around us. They understand that they exist in the same reality that you do. They understand that you're a human being just as they're a human being, and so you share that reality. And so they lean heavily upon all of this in order to convey their idea first onto a piece of paper, which is then conveyed from that piece of paper back into the audience's mind, and then the audience looks at this thing and brings it to life within their own mind. To some extent, this is what suspension of disbelief is. It's the reader saying to themselves, okay, I'm going to ignore all of the limitations of the way this piece of art was set down because it's such a good representation of reality that I can ignore them and simply believe that I'm actually watching this as it happens. And so treating it as if it was an actual part of reality. And the better the artist can do that, the better the artist can understand the limitations of reality and then express those limitations in a way that you can see it as if it was happening in front of you, the better the artist they are. And so with all of that, what is an objectively bad piece of art? An objectively bad piece of art is something that doesn't follow the rules of reality and doesn't allow the thing to be brought into external reality, whether it be a building or a story that comes to life in your mind. If it can't be brought into external reality in that way, it is a bad piece of art. Now, as I said, let me go over some of the other ways that I've talked about quote-unquote progressive art as actually being bad art. The first way that I talked about it in a video that I entitled, I think it was, A Woke Story is Always an Inferior Story, and again, I'll link all of these in the description. What I talked about is that exact thing, is the misuse of the idea of reality. Because, as I said, if you have a good piece of art, if you have someone who is telling a story, they are trying to use the medium of reality, understanding that you live in the same reality that they do, you experience the same human existence reality that they do, they're depending on those things and telling the story so that the story can come to life in your mind. But the point is that when you do that as an artist, the better you are at it, the better artist you are, but really the point being is that you can take 100% of your resources and actually concentrate on the story because you're depending upon a reality, both of human existence and the reality that exists around us, that you don't need to explain to the reader because the reader understands reality by being a human being and living in the same reality as the author. Therefore, you don't have to explain it. But for people who have this quote-unquote progressive mentality, they either don't think that reality exists, or at the very least that their subjective reality can trump objective reality whenever the two come in contact. That is to say, my reality is actually more important than what you or anybody else claims as objective reality. This is one of the pillars of your progressive ideology. Why? Because if you take progressive ideology and apply actual reason and logic to it, which are derived from reality itself, it falls to pieces. And so they need to depend upon my reality, the definition of each individual of my reality. And so progressivism itself does the exact same thing. And when you do that, and you're trying to write a story, and you're writing not according to what reality is, saying this is objective, but according to what my subjective interpretation of reality is, then you need to explain what that reality is and how to understand it. And so you need to rob some of your resources. And your resources can be how many scenes you can shoot, how many words you can put on a page, how many pages you have to use, how long you're going to hold the attention of this reader. All of these things are limited resources. You're going to have to use some of those in order to give them the key, in order to give them the legend in the corner, at the very least referring to other things which allow them to understand your reality in order for them to understand the story. And and so it is an inferior product all the time. 
Because, again, the person who is using a traditional form of storytelling can take 100% of his resources and put it towards creating a good representation of reality, whereas your woke, quote-unquote, progressive storytelling needs to include that legend in there and steal some of their resources in order to do that in order for you to understand their story. Now, do I have an example of this? Yes, I've gone over this many times. The best example of it was a podcast I listened to from Marvel Comics. When they were presenting what they said was the future great writers for Marvel Comics, and all of the three or four writers that were in this little group talked about presenting not reality, but their reality. They talked about lensing, they talked about using a series of mirrors, and basically it all boiled down to, I'm describing how I see reality. And in order for the reader to understand what's going on in the story, they too need to look through these series of lenses, which is basically me, myself, of the author, and her identity, in order to understand it. So they're stealing some of the resources to present this reflection of reality in order to set up these lenses or mirrors so that you have to look through them in order for you to understand what's going on in the story. And again, this is an inferior product to a traditional story. And it is, in fact, bad art. Why? Again, because they're not using reality in the way that it's supposed to be. It's not a reflection of reality in the traditional way of storytelling or the traditional way of art. And so, since it's a poor reflection of what reality actually is, since they're depending on my interpretation of reality, then it's a bad piece of art. Now, I'm sure if they wanted to make it a part of the story that this is how I see reality in this story and then make it something that a character is trying to go through, you might actually be able to do that in a good story. But when you're making it the entire basis of how you interpret the story, no, it's a bad piece of art. So let's move on to something very simple like editing. Editing is typically broken down into two different forms, copy editing and content editing. Now what both of these things do is they take rules, the first of language, the second of reality, and apply them to your story to see where it needs to be fixed. As I have mentioned several times, I have a novel which I have written, which I hope to get published in the future. I went through professional editors in order to get it both copy edited and content edited. And when they did content edit, what they would do is tell me things like, a normal person doesn't speak this way, rewrite the dialogue. Or, this character is not fleshed out enough, it doesn't look like an actual person, rewrite the character. Or they would tell me, this person said A here, and the opposite of A there, this is not consistent, and so since it's not consistent, rewrite it. Again, it's the applying of what actually happens within reality and human existence to the story to tell you where it's falling down. Now, if you read something like Marvel Comics today, everything reads like a first draft that was never edited. Why? Because the editors don't edit anymore. They can copy edit, they can say you need a period here and a comma here and that's a run-on sentence, but they won't content edit anybody anymore. Why? Because they're quote-unquote progressives, and the entire office is this way, and they tell a story in the way where it is not reality that governs the story, but my reality that governs the story. And if it's my reality, then I can determine what the rules of that reality are, and you can't tell me I'm violating rules of an objective reality by saying I need to follow continuity, by saying people don't act this way, by saying this is not what happens in actual reality when people interact with each other. No, that doesn't matter because it's my reality, not the reality that actual content editing needs to appeal to to actually have some kind of merit for your story and to make it better. And when you don't have that, again, when you apply my reality instead of the reality, which is objective, to your story, you have a bad piece of art. Let's look at something that I did probably a half a dozen videos on about this point, which is the way they use color, both on the television screen and the movie screen and in comics. They use color now in this quote-unquote progressive way. In this, certainly for comics, this feminized color palette, this way that does not appeal to men. Now, this point of why it's bad art actually does play into the reality of who your audience is as well, but it certainly has a key element of being a bad piece of art. So, as I have said many times in the past, I looked this up because at one point I did a video where I was watching Kelly Sue DeConnick, the creator of the modern Captain Marvel, and she was saying and ridiculing the idea that 
I don't see with women's eyes. That is to say, there's a difference between men and women's eyes, and she was just ridiculing the idea. And I distrust her enough to actually go and look up the things that she claims to be true, and I found that that's actually not the case at all. Men and women have different eyes. Human eyes have M cells and P cells. Men have a concentration of one, women have a concentration of the other. Which means what? Which means that women can see more colors than men. Why is this? Well, because typically men are the hunters and women are the gatherers and the caretakers. And these concentration of their eyes being this way actually helps them in those roles because for thousands of years, for millennia upon millennia, we've been instinctually trained, our bodies have been instinctually trained in order to follow these norms. So for a guy, he can typically see in primary colors. Why? Because the filtering out of all the rest of these colors allows him to look for shapes and movement. Looking for shapes and movement allow him to become a better hunter, or give him the defenses so he's not the one being hunted. A great modern example of this was the fact that in World War II, when they had these massive bombers going over sites and they wanted people who were manning the targeting system to actually be able to see through the camouflage of the other side, what did they do? Well, they got colorblind people to actually man the targeting system. Why? Because since they couldn't see color at all, they were used to seeing shapes and movement much better. And so they could see through the camouflage right away. And so they'd say, bomb that area, and they would be right. And the very opposite is for women. You have women who are typically the gatherers of the group. They're looking at a plant that is very similar to another plant. They're saying, no, that's off by two shades of green. That's the poisonous one. Don't eat that. Or they're looking at their child when there was no real medical anything at all. And they're saying, my child is two shades of white off what they usually are. That's an indication to me that something is wrong. I got to find out what's going on here. And so they become a better caregiver to their child. But the point being that, certainly within comics, and I would add movies and television to this as well, you see them starting to use, and have been using really for the last 10 years or so, what I would call a feminized color palette, where you have all these mud colors. And as a guy, I'm looking at it going, this makes no sense. This is visually confusing to me. I cannot pick out from this sequential art what the movement is supposed to be because there's too much color in the way. I can't see the shapes and movement nor connect them together. And when I can't can't connect them together, I can't understand the reality of what is going on, nor construct it and bring it to life in my mind, and therefore it becomes a bad piece of art. And people typically say, well, it's a good piece of art for a woman, it's just your problem. Well, it's not just my problem, because they've done studies on tiny little babies when they could just begin to see, and they know that boys actually are attracted more to shapes and movement and girls are attracted more to human faces. And if you have something like a comic book, which is dependent upon putting sequential art together in your mind through shapes, and again, bringing that movement to life, who do you think is going to be the majority of people that actually read this art? It's going to be guys. And just as an aside, most people usually bring up manga at this point, and I would say, well, you look at manga, it's typically in black and white, and I would say it's much more a cultural thing that you have women reading much more manga than you have women reading North American comics. But that's a separate topic entirely, which I've covered in other videos. The basic gist of those videos being the fact that if you want to express this representation of reality for women, you typically can do it much better in a different style of art, in a different form of art, something like a novel rather than a comic book. Because here's what happens, especially concerning color, when you try to do it with a comic book. Because for the last at least 10 years, they've been trying to draw in this what they see as massive female audience that they want to bring into comics, and they're putting in this mud, feminized color palette, and part of that is their overuse of orange and teal. Now, why those two colors specifically? Well, because at the very least, back to the point where they started making color movies, people understood the fact that orange and teal are the colors that you typically get at sun up and sun down. And why is that important? Well, because the human body instinctually sees that time of day as being a time of heightened emotion. Why? Because you're either going into darkness and your body's telling you, you don't have all your senses, be careful, or you're going into light and your body is telling you, 
you're coming out of darkness, you can be relieved now. And so again, instinctually, the human body has heightened emotions when it is exposed to the colors of sun up and sun down, which is orange and teal. If you look at something like Gone with the Wind, the major emotional sequences in that movie were specifically shot at sun up and sun down in order to promote this emotional reaction within the people who are watching the movie. And so, if you have these comic producers who are trying desperately to attract a female audience because they think that's going to save them, they have to appeal to that female audience, and they know, just as well as I do, that females are attracted to the emotional. Why? Well, again, go back to that little baby in the crib, reacting more to the human face than to shapes and movement. Girls typically grow up in that fashion and therefore are more attracted to the emotional. And so they use these colors to invoke emotion within the reader and so attract more female audiences. But the point being that they overuse these two colors of orange and teal, and then it breaks the entire piece of art. Why? Because just as instinctually your body is put into a hyper emotional state when it is exposed to these colors, so too your body understands that these colors only exist in short bursts because sun up and sun down only last for a very short amount of time. And so if you overuse these colors of orange and teal, then your body is instinctually going to tell your mind that no, something's not right here. This is not reality. Why? Because I know this is going on for too long, and therefore your instincts are telling you this is a bad representation of reality, and therefore a bad piece of art. And we know this because they've tried this. They tried it with movies. They tried entire movies shot in orange and teal, and people really were off put by it because it existed for too long. So really, that's a recap of all the ways that I've talked about this in the past. Now, I want to talk about this in a different way today as well. And it was prompted by a book that I picked up, which was called Patch. It is Marvel's attempt to try to invigorate their comic sales by appealing to old stories from the 80s and 90s, thinking that nostalgia is going to actually save them, which is something I warned everybody about was going to happen probably about a year and a half ago now. And the point being that what they usually do with these kinds of nostalgia things is they started off by having both artists and writers from that old time period do a story that they didn't get to do in that old time period that's just been sitting around. And that worked pretty well when you're actually doing something like Walter Simonson and Louise Simonson doing a book together. But when you have an artist or a writer that is not from that time period, it does not work. And this book, which is supposed to be a throwback to the original Wolverine ongoing series, which I gobbled up when it first came out, because all of us were waiting for years and years for an actual Wolverine series after that miniseries, that great miniseries came out. But I picked up this new book, and I looked at it, and I looked at the new style of art that they were using, and it just threw me off. And there was one panel in particular that really threw me off. And it was this panel that I'm showing you in the background. This is one of the side characters within the Patch stories. He is a pilot, and he is someone who is there within the original stories. And when I looked at his posture, I said to myself, that is a soy boy posture. That is not the same character as it was within the original stories. Yes, in the original stories, this character was hunched over, but he was hunched over in a working man's way of being hunched over, in a way to say, I'm done with this day, I've done enough work, leave me alone. There is a distinct difference between those two kinds of things. And here's where that one panel brought my mind into this entire thing and doing this video. Most of you have probably seen this image that I'm flashing up on the screen before. It is an image that is comparing a soy boy posture to a Chad posture, and there is a distinct difference between the two. And here's partly, certainly a greater part, of where that actually comes from. And I actually learned about this through several different means. First off, to give you something personal about myself, I have what I would consider a very Scottish build. I'm of average height, just bordering on tall, but I have very long legs as compared to the size of my torso. To me, that's a Scottish trait. And I was always told, because I had this skeletal structure, that it gave me an arch in my back and therefore made my posture poor. And I've struggled with poor posture since I was a kid. But I found out after a while, no, it wasn't anything to do with my skeletal structure or anything like that. It was simply that I had 
bad posture. And I'll go into that in a second. But I want to put in this little sidetrack here. I started to struggle with my posture. That is to say, I started to stand up straight when I was a kid for a very specific reason. Everybody told me to stand up straight. My brothers told me to stand up straight. My parents told me to stand up straight. The people at school, teachers, and kids told me to stand up straight. I didn't listen to any of them. It wasn't until Captain America told me to stand up straight that I actually listened and started to stand up straight. I can remember the exact moment. I was watching NBC Saturday morning cartoons. Captain America did his little PSA at the end, and he talked about, have respect for yourself, stand up straight. And I said, that's what I'm going to do. And even today, if I find myself hunching over, I still think about Captain America telling me to stand up straight, and I stand up straight. This is one of the reasons why I think that these quote-unquote progressive people controlling comic books and popular culture right now is so dangerous. I am one of those people who, as a kid, was extremely influenced by this very tiny little thing that was exposed to me by someone I considered a hero, that is to say, Captain America. But anyway, back to my poor posture and how it leads into this soy boy posture. And I have confirmed some of these facts with my sister, who is an actual physiotherapist and a personal trainer, so I do have some supporting evidence for this. But I'll give you my layman's terms understanding of what is going on with my bad posture and what causes soy boy kind of posture. It's very simple, really. What you have is people who are not active and people who sit down too much. And it's not even slouching, it's just sitting down too much and not being active. Because you have your major bone in your pelvic area, and it is connected to your legs through tendons in the front and the back. And if you sit down too much and are not active, those tendons in the front start to shrink and get used to being in this shortened way of existing because you're simply sitting down too much. And so when you stand up, it typically doesn't stretch as much as it's supposed to and therefore starts to tilt your pelvic area forward. And as such, the rest of your body tries to compensate. And what it does is it typically gives you an overextended arch in your back, in your lower back, which causes some kinds of back problems and poor posture because all of the muscle groups in your back are connected together in one form or another. I'm sure you can probably attest to this yourself. If you've injured your lower back and find out that your neck is hurting for some reason or vice versa, you understand how interconnected everything in your back is. And so when you have this problem that is caused by being inactive and it causes this pelvic tilt and then this arch in your back way, it then cascades upwards in order for you to keep your center of gravity over your feet, your shoulders therefore start to hunch forward and your neck follows hunching itself forward and what do you got? You got a soy boy posture. Now you may be saying to yourself, well that's not really a soy boy posture, that's just a modern posture because people sit down too much now. I would say, well there is another connection to this that actually includes someone like a quote-unquote progressive person to be more exposed to what you see and how they actually view how a human being is actually supposed to stand and what normal posture is, which then leads into the art. So I'll go over that for a second. Now, if you've ever read any quote-unquote progressive literature or listened to what they have to say, it's all about oppression. It's all about we are oppressed. We are, as a group, being oppressed. And they see oppression everywhere. And if you read their stories, certainly something like comic books, you would see this oppression coming out again and again in the idea of a bully. It seems, in these stories, that they just can't let that go. To them, that's the source of all the world's problems, is the bullies in high school. They concentrate on this high school bully kind of mentality so much, I would call it even an obsession. And there is quite specifically a reason for that, and I do believe the majority of that reason is because of this soy boy posture. And here's my evidence for that. Back in the 80s and the 90s, they did studies with herd animals and the predators that prey upon them. So they were studying things like zebras in a herd and lions and how lions actually pick out the weak ones from the herd in order to attack. 
because that's what they knew was going on. These lions would always go after the weak ones in the herd, but they didn't know exactly why they would consider them to be weak when we as humans really can't tell the difference. And they found out that one of the reasons, one of the earmarks for the lion to instinctually understand that one of these members of the herd was hurt or weak was it had its head down. And some inquisitive social scientists decided to see if this actually worked with human beings as well. Because human beings are both herd animals and the predator of these herd animals at the same time. So what they did, and again this was back in the 90s, what they did was they went to prisons and started to interview muggers and see how they would actually pick people out of a crowd in order to make them a mark and say, I'm going to mug them. And when they started asking them questions and try to find out how they picked people out, they found the exact same thing happened. That instinctually, these muggers would be in a high traffic area where you would have a big herd of people and they would look at these people and if those people would look back at them, they would say, no, that's someone I don't want to mess with. They're returning my glances, don't want to mess with them. But if they're continually looking at this person and that person, no matter how much the mugger is staring at them, never returns their glances, always has their head down, or if they do look up and meet the glance of the mugger, then they would automatically look back down and not meet their gaze again that was one of the key factors for the mugger to say, that's a mark. That's someone I'm going to go after. And it wasn't something that they were taught. It was something that these muggers instinctually knew. Looking through the herd, they found someone with their head down, and that was their mark. So let's apply that to high school and high school bullies. You have a herd of people. You have people who are typically of this hunched over fashion. You have the people who keep their head down. And they don't understand why they're being picked on. They don't understand why the bullies are singling them out. Well, it's because you have your head down. As a person with your head down in this crowd of people, you're raising a red flag to the world to say, I'm a prey animal and I'm in distress. And then the more predatory of our species are going to look at you and say, that's easy prey. I'm going after them. And so you have this chain reaction. You have these people who are not very active, who sit down too much, who start to have this posture of being slouched over. Being slouched over raises a red flag for people to exploit them. When people start to exploit them, what do they do? They retreat to the safety of the herd. Add that to the fact that I don't know how many writers I've encountered that talk about their progressive awakening when they were in high school, when they were teenagers. Why? Well, because they were people who were of this fashion and their herd that they started to gravitate towards was people that were thinking exactly like them and being persecuted exactly like them, presenting themselves as wounded herd animals. They were naturally singled out and they were naturally persecuted and therefore they started to gravitate towards things like feminism. Again, I don't know how many of these authors have said things like, that's when I had my feminist awakening. Of course you had your feminist awakening then. Why? Because feminism was telling you, it's not your fault, it's everyone else's fault. You're not being singled out and made fun of because of you. You're being singled out and made fun of because of them. They're the problem. And then this herd that they gravitate towards with this same mentality, with these progressive ideas that say it's them, not you, is going to grow tighter and tighter. They're going to seek defense in this herd mentality where they all think in the same way. And again, while it might be partly their upbringing, it is their problem. They are presenting themselves as prey animals. This is the problem. But you might say, what does this all have to do with bad art? Well, imagine you're one of these quote-unquote progressive people. You get stuck in this herd of people who think exactly the same way that you do and really exist in the exact same way that you do. And one of the things about this quote-unquote progressive ideology is that it starts to erase what you see as being actual reality and replace it with ideological facts. Again, this is one of the things that the ideology of progressivism has to do because it can't exist in reality itself. If you apply things like logic and reason based upon reality to it, it falls apart. Therefore, it must destroy in the minds of the people who adhere to it, destroy their understanding of how reality actually works and replace it with their ideological understanding. 
And so, if you're one of this herd, if you're one of these progressive people who are grouping together more and more in this herd for protection and excluding anybody who would see them as prey animals by sticking to this herd, and your understanding of reality is being replaced one by one by these progressive talking points, you're going to see the herd around you of weak, ineffectual prey animals as being the norm. And this has been going on with something like comics since at least the 90s. I covered an interview with Bobby Chase, who was one of the editors-in-chief for Marvel back in the 90s. And this is the exact thing that she described. She described a working environment where she had nothing but these quote-unquote progressive people around her, and even though she was told to keep her politics out of the stories that she was controlling, she put those politics directly in there. Why? Because she saw it affecting disproportionately the people around her in her office and thought that this was how everybody in the country actually thought, when nothing could be farther from the truth. But that's what she was reprogrammed to think. And so if you look at something like Hollywood or Marvel right now, which is a good microcosm of this larger entertainment system, if you look at that, all you're going to see in the office around you is these progressive people. Now, added to that the fact that with Marvel and these other comic companies, they look for typically one of two kind of people to be artists. Number one, they're looking for foreigners that they can exploit who have actual good art skills so that they can pay them next to nothing, or if you're going to get someone who is in North America and part of the system that is actually set up here, they're going to look for a heavy progressive. I've gone over this a dozen times in videos. And one of the things that actually comes out within this is they're looking for people who are not professionally trained. Why? Because you have all these professionally trained rules that they don't think that artists need to follow anymore. I did a video about this woman who works for Marvel, who typically does cover art. This was the woman who said in a Comic-Con panel that what her art is there for is to show women feeling their feelings. But the reason why I'm talking about her is because she did actually attend an artist school. I think it was the Kubert School for about six to eight months, and then she quit. Why did she quit? Because there were just too many rules that they were trying to impose upon her. And she said she found out she didn't like sequential art. And I'm sitting there listening, thinking to myself, lady, comics are sequential art. If you don't like sequential art, why in the world are you working in comics? But anyway, I'm getting off on a sidetrack. The point being that you have these people and they don't want professionally trained people who are artists. They want people who train themselves to be artists. And here's the problem. If you're training yourself to be an artist and you're surrounded by this herd of people who look like a bunch of soy boys, what are you gonna think the natural stance of a human being is going to be? It's going to be this soy boy kind of posture. And here's how that breaks this kind of storytelling. If you have stories where you have characters doing these massively dramatic things that have to be physical, they have to have the widest range of physical movement that is available to a human being. And instinctually, the rest of us who are reading these books, who are not tainted by this progressive ideology, are looking at these people with this soy boy posture and saying to ourselves instinctually, no, this person is not going to be able to do those things. It doesn't matter if you have superpowers laid onto this, because that's something in the forefront of your mind. This is the instinctual part of your mind saying, no, I'm sorry, this is a herd animal that is weak. There's no way they're going to be this kind of hero. There's no way they're going to sacrifice themselves for others. There's no way they're going to physically be able to do these things. And this kind of instinctual understanding is baked right into comics. If you look at something like the stories of Peter Parker, Spider-Man, those early stories, he was that hunched over kid. And as he developed into a hero, as he became someone who took that power that he got and used it responsibly, what did he do? He started to get out of his shell, stop being this nerdy little kid, this hunched over little kid, and become an actual man, and become an actual hero. If you look at something like Clark Kent, Superman, this is one of the ways which he originally tried to disguise himself as Clark Kent, so no one would think of him as Superman. Today, they just say, oh, Clark Kent is Superman. So he's announced to the world that, yes, Clark Kent is Superman. It makes no sense. But the point being that this is how he used to hide. He used to hide by being hunched over. This was one of the ways the artists actually had to draw him. And we're told, this is how you draw Clark Kent. Why? Because both in the story and the artist knew that portraying him in such a way 
people would not think of him as Superman. They would not equate this hunched over person with his bad posture as a heroic individual. And so my point being that you have these artists who think that it's normal to draw people in soy boy fashion throughout their books, and the rest of us who know differently, who know that that's not the norm for people because a lot of us are sitting here just going, yeah, we actually have to work for a living, we actually have to be on our feet most of the day, and so no, we can't put up with this bad posture. We might have a working man's bad posture at times, but no, we're not soy boys. We don't have this bad posture. We know what an actual healthy human posture is, just in the instinctual part of our minds. And we're looking at these characters going, this character cannot do that thing. Instinctually, we're saying that in our minds. And so we're saying, this is a bad representation of reality. This person cannot do this thing. Therefore, that's not real. Therefore, it's a bad representation of reality. Therefore, it's bad art. And the same thing happens when they try to use three-dimensional artists in order to actually put some more movement into this art. It doesn't work because they're using a stiff model. It's not an actual representation of a human being and how they move. And it leads to the exact same thing. It leads to the instinctual part of your brain going, that person cannot do that thing. They have, from what I can see visually from this art that is using 3D models, they have a limited range of motion, therefore they're not going to be able to do this thing. Which honestly is extremely funny. I remember a documentary from the late 90s, early 2000s, when at Comic Cons they still had people from Marvel and DC looking over submissions of art and portfolios and saying to that person, yeah, you should come and work for Marvel. They were following this one guy and he brought up his portfolio and it looked kind of okay. But at that time, what was he told? The guy looked at him from Marvel and said, you're probably using 3D models or people to actually sketch out most of this, aren't you? And the guy said, yeah, I am. And he said, I'm sorry, there's no way if you do that, that you can work for any of the big companies. You just can't. Not only is there time constraints and you can't do that with every picture, but it's just not natural. That was back in the late 90s. Today, this is what they're looking for within their artist and they don't care. And why do they not care? Well, they don't care, once again, because it's not based upon giving you an accurate representation of reality. What they're doing is giving you the so-called accurate interpretation of my reality, the my reality of a progressive reality, which, as I've said many a times in this video, just gives you in so many ways, nothing but bad art. Well, that turned into a bit of a rant. If I've given you anything new to think about, hit like, hit the shield in the lower right hand corner of your screen to subscribe and leave me a comment. Tell me what you think about all this. All right, I'll see you later. Bye.